So let's just, so Lord, we hold the word above our heads, acknowledging that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God, we place a value on your word and we cherish it. God, we say our hearts are open for you, Lord God, to throw seeds in and grow as you add to our maturity and our transformation to become more like you. We bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Wow. All right. So, yeah, we're coming in into Pentecost. Well, not coming. We are in Pentecost right now. So that's what this, this Sunday is all about. We're going to be celebrating the Lord. And, and uh, just, I know there's just a couple. I think many know this, but just for the humor me. Feasts are not Jewish feasts. Whose are they? God's feasts. That's right. That's right. Genesis 127, put the stars in the sky to do the seasons. We translate that as season, summer, fall, winter, spring. That's not what it means. If you look that word up, it actually means appointed feasts, right? So the stars are in the skies to tell us when the appointed feasts are. And I just want to get into, into, Pente- into this. Before I start in, I feel like we're supposed to say it. There's something that really impacted me last week when I was reading the Old Testament. Uh, Alan got me on that. I was reading again that portion of scripture with Josiah, when Josiah finds the law, right? And he finds the instructions and instruction on how they should be worshiping the Lord. And he reads it, right? And he finds out and he realizes something. What does he realize? He realizes that Israel has not been worshiping God the way that God has wanted to be worshiped. So he drops to his knees, tears his clothes, right? Reinstates the law in there. But I want you to catch something. So you talk about a long period of time of corrupt kings before him that allowed things into Israel that wasn't the way God intended. When he opened up the book of the law and when Josiah saw it, what's one thing that's not recorded in there? Oh no, I'll have to find my place later. The one thing that is not recorded in there, you not once see the words, but this is how we've always done it. Right, and that's one thing we have to really, we're coming into a season, and I know you heard me just Lou to, to Pastor Ken there, but remember last year before I asked the Lord, I felt the Lord say, I want you to start teaching on the feast. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me do this. Three days later, Pastor Matthew called me out of the blue and said, can I sit down and talk to you about the feasts? The more you study the feasts, the more you see Jesus, the more you realize it's not a Jewish festival, which it is because they're God's people, but the more you see Jesus in each one of the feasts and you can celebrate Jesus in that way. And that is what we're doing here. And We're going to celebrate God in the Feast of Pentecost and just go for it. Right? So the Feast of the First Pentecost... First Pentecost happened on Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given and the Lord made covenant with everyone there. Now this is important because they made covenant with everyone there because we need to really understand when we first get into this, who is everyone, right? So he goes up, you know the, thing, uh, you know the story, which we're going to look at it in a second. He descends on the mountain with smoke. Moses goes up there, gets the tablets for the first time. He comes down, makes covenant with all of Israel. But it's important to know that it just wasn't the direct, even though it was, the direct line of Abraham that became Israel. How do we know? Later on, which because I'm going to get to the books, I'm going back to front. We know that Rahab had the honor of being in the lineage of Christ. She was the mother of Boaz. Where was Rahab? Rahab was the, uh, the woman, you know, in Jericho when the spies go in. She hides them in the room. They spare her life because she covers for them, right? She has the honor of literally being in the lineage of Christ. The mother of Boaz. We love Boaz, right? That's the pickup line. Hey, girl, I want to be your Boaz, right? <laughs> right, so there were, <laughs> I got to stay focused. Okay. <laughs> Right, and that's just for evidence of that. That's Matthew 1, 5, right? She's the mother of Boaz, right? And then the other thing, if, if we turn to uh, Exodus 12. Oh, no, it's not hitting. We, we ran into... Uh-oh. Well, we might not have it. If, it may be case if you can just push the arrows. I'm not going to worry about it if it's there. I had a really cool thing. My son came in and taught me a new technique, too, and I threw it in there, and I was all excited about it. But it is what it is. Okay, Exodus 12. If you could go down to that Exodus 12 side there, please. For me, uh, the next one, first slide. It, Exodus twelve thirty eight. if we go to that right here. So it specifically says, I'll read it. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herd, and a great deal of livestock. This verse is really important understanding Pentecost. Why? Specifically in Exodus twelve thirty eight, it says when they left, it was a mixed multitude. Who was that mixed multitude? It wasn't just Israelites. It was Egyptians that saw the one true God perform signs and wonders in their midst. And they must have had some kind of revelation. Hey, this is the only God. And they came with them. Uh, 
we, we can't say that for sure, but if you, if you study different people's uh, time of that, there would have been foreigners added with them as well. So they come here, so it's important to understand that a mixed multitude left Egypt. And so when we're going to see here, when the time of Pentecost, the first Pentecost hit with the Ten Commandments, it said everyone that was there, and the Lord made covenant with everyone that was there. And it was a mixed multitude. Right? It was just a prophetic picture. We're going to see that of Acts chapter 2, which we're going to go over in a second, who was also there, a mixed multitude. Right? All the nations were represented there. If you could go to the next slide, please. Just hit the arrow down. Or... We're going to turn to Exodus 19. I'm going to read 10, 14 to 20. So, this is really important. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today, and tomorrow let them wash their clothes. Okay, that's a highlighted part in my notes here. Let them wash their clothes. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come to your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thundering and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of a trumpet, the shofar, was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Where am I? Sorry, the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely covered in smoke, because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain greatly quaked. And when the blast of a trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. Then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai and was at the top of the mountain. And the Lord called to Moses from the top of the mountain, and he went up. So you see there are two things I want to point out from this verse. Right? Exodus 19.10, it said, let them wash their clothes. Right now, what's that, what's that a prophetic symbol of? Now, it's not us washing our own clothes because we don't have the ability to walk in purity ourselves. But we clothe ourselves with Christ. And Christ has given us his righteousness, his purity because of what he did on the cross. And so Christ himself has purified us and has prepared us for the fulfillment of the covenant that is going to be released in Acts chapter 2. Let them wash their clothes. But thank God that was a prophetic picture because then they could have. It was a symbol of what was to come. But now we look at us in the spiritual sense. I can't wash my own physical, spiritual clothes. It had to be the Lord. Jesus Christ took that when he saw the cross. I love that imagery. I never, ever thought of that before. He would have seen people on the cross, and I'm sure he would have stopped and looked. He had to have. He had to have. He's human. right? He had to have stopped and looked. And so we see Jesus. Jesus is the one that washed our clothes for us, put on Christ. We put on the righteousness of God. And now we are ready to receive the covenant that the Lord was going to when he descends in fire. And in Israel we see that. I forget exactly what verse that's in. 19-ish. 19-18. Exodus um, 19-18. It says that he descended in fire. When was the next time the Lord descended in fire? Acts chapter 2. Right? They said, we're going to get into that in a second. A pillar of fire appeared above their heads, and they came down. Let me go to the next slide. Hebrews 10, 9 to 10 says this. And then he said, God, Jesus, talking to Jesus, God, Jesus said, God, I will be the one to go and do your will. So by being the sacrifice that removes sin, he abolishes animal sacrifices and replaces that entire system with the new covenant. By God's will, we have been purified, made holy once and for all through the sacrifice of the body of the Messiah. By God's will, it says here, we have been purified, right, hence washed themselves, but this time Jesus did the washing. So this is all lined up for a beautiful feast. We can think of it as something cool that comes down. That it's interesting that uh, the, the early church separated, celebrated Pentecost as the birth of the new church, which is why uh, Pentecost, or the, the day of worship was moved from Saturday to Sunday. But you can read in old historical documents that the Catholic Church itself, by no power of the word, this is in their own writing, you can read it, by no power of the word, took it upon themselves to change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. Took it upon themselves. You can, you can read it. It is not hidden. Google search it. You will find it. They took it upon themselves, and it says their own writing, through no authority of the word. And so the church has continued to celebrate this one because Constantine said it was okay, and Constantine pushed out all the rest. But this day is so important. We have to celebrate each and every one of them because those are the days that the Lord has asked to be celebrated. And if the Lord asks to be celebrated that way, I wouldn't dare say, sorry, sorry, bro. I got a tradition to keep. We can't do it. 
We can't do it. So this is important to see Jesus in this. And you can mirror it. It's a beautiful picture of Christ in the Old Testament to the New. Right? So let's go. Into, let's, well, I think the next slide isn't there. Exodus 23. We're not going to read it, but you can write that down if you want. Exodus 23, 20 to 33 explains the blessing. I love that amen. It's not, yeah. That's Maggie that time. All right. Oh, I forgot to do it. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt again. I want to get in the habit every Sunday of blessing our children, right? So let's, we'll stretch our hands to Maggie and them downstairs. Lord, again, we thank you for the heritage of children. God, we just bless them here in the service. God, we bless their little amens and everything they do. And we bless the children's ministry downstairs. I let them grow in the knowledge and authority of who you are. And we bless them as a church body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Exodus 20, uh, 23, 20, 20 to 33, is, you can read it, explains all the blessings that the Lord will bestow upon Israel in this new covenant. It's, it's great to read. If you read it, it will encourage you. But they must keep his commands and serve the Lord God only. Only. That's the key. And this is where he makes covenant with all of Israel. It says, with everyone assembled. Everyone assembled. So everyone that left Egypt, that mixed multitude that came out, now everyone assembled at the foot of the mountain, and the Lord makes covenant with every single person there, descendants of Abraham, Egyptians, and possibly foreigners. And they go into that place, and they accept covenant, which prophetically points, that's a, a beautiful prophetic picture of Acts chapter 2, when it said uh, all the nations of the world were represented there. All the nations, all the known nations of the world were represented in that one spot. And tongues of fire fell down. That's going to get exciting. I'll explain that in a bit. I can't jump ahead. Okay? Hmm. Okay, Exodus 24, 7 to 8. But this is important to say. Then Moses took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the mixed, Jeremy translation, the mixed multitude of people. And this is what the people, the mixed multitude, responded. All that the Lord has said, we will do. And be obedient. All that the Lord has said, we will do. They accepted the covenant. All they had to do was accept it. Does it sound familiar today? We don't have to shed our blood on a cross. We just have to, we have to accept what Jesus Christ did for us. Amen, right? So this is important. Then Moses took the blood from the basins and splattered it over the people, declaring, Look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you in giving you these instructions. Then you'll notice my bottom slide said, Then the covenant, then came a covenant meal. There's eight signs of covenant, um, which I, I taught a little bit on the power of communion, if you taught that class, if you remember that class. But I'm going to focus on one of them, one of the signs of covenant that they would do was something called the covenant meal. So I want you to catch how important this is. They agree in Exodus 24, 7 to 8. We are going to be obedient to the covenant. They accept it. The covenant is offered. The Father offers it. The people say, Yahweh offers it. People say, yes, we're in. Right? Immediately after that, let's go to the next slide. Exodus 24, 9 to 11. So that's 7 and 8. Oh, sorry, go back one more. I guess I didn't put that on the slide. My bad. All right? It's 9 to 8. I want you to read this. It says, Moses and Aaron and that 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the Lord God of Israel. And there under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heavens for clearness. And he did not lay his hand or destroy them on the chief men of Israel. They beheld God, ate and drank. So after they said, yes, we received the covenant, they went up on the mountain. And remember what the Lord tells Moses? He says, you can't see me and live. This is before that. The Lord goes up there and it makes mention in verse 11 that he did not lay his hand on them. The Lord issues the covenant. He sits down before them, stands before them and says, let's share a meal. In the presence of, of Yahweh, they shared a meal. It said they beheld them and they ate and drank. What happens? The Lord is getting ready. Jesus Christ is ready to go to the cross. What does he do? He gets ready to fulfill the covenant that the Lord Yahweh has sent him to do, that he responded and said, yes, Lord, I'll do. And what does he do before he hits the cross? He sits down with his disciples, what we just shared, and has a covenant meal with them saying, this is my body, this is my blood. The covenant meal happened in Exodus. The covenant meal happened in the Gospels when Jesus sat down with them and said, earnestly I have desired to share this meal with you. Because he was making covenant, and it was a sign that covenant was going to be fulfilled. Whew. Imagine seeing God like the 70 elders. Imagine beholding him the one time in a mixed reference that the Lord did not lay his hand on him. But he actually allowed them to behold him in his glory. 
No, it doesn't say if they saw his face or not, but it doesn't matter. They were in the presence of the eternal God of Yahweh, and they ate with him a covenant meal, and they shared a meal in the presence of Yahweh. And then the fire falls. Right? They have a covenant meal. Jesus has a covenant meal with his disciples. One of the way, there's many ways, but I won't get into all eight of them right now. Look them, you'll find them. They're very easy to find. Right? Study them. And Jesus knows where he's going, and he knows the fire is going to fall a short time from now. He says, I want to have a covenant meal. And he fulfills another act of the sacrifice, right? The shedding of blood, the planting of a tree. Cursed is one who hangs on a tree. That was another symbol. You plant a, a ceremonial tree together. Jesus Christ became cursed and hung on the planted tree. Had the covenant meal with his disciples to pave a brand new way for you and I that are coming. Yes. He's right. Oh, man. Leviticus 23, we're going to go into a little bit of this. It's not on my slide there. You can just keep that one up. This is a whole sermon on itself, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't go, but I'm just going to read it. It says bef- it was also a harvest celebration, which I needed to allude to because of Pentecost. Uh, it says before they would, they would harvest, they would wave loaves of bread as an offering. Two loaves, the priest would wave two loaves. What do you think the two loaves represented? They didn't know what it was. Jew and Gentile. And they would wave it before the Lord. And it says this, Exodus 22, or 23, 22, I'll read one. When you harvest the crops of your hand, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields. Do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. This verse is deep for two reasons. Number one, that, like I said before that, you'll read it in there. They wave the, the, the two loaves. Jew and Gentile, a prophetic picture that was going to be brought to the Lord because of Jesus Christ, the great high priest. Yes, come on. Pictures. It's all Jesus is in there. It's amazing. That's right. Oh, no. It's okay, Maggie. When you harvest, oh, yeah, this verse, the, the 22, is deep because it shows us our call to be compassionate to the poor and the needy. And it's also a picture of us giving out of what the Lord has already provided. The Lord provided the harvest. We believe it, right? They believe. They thank the Lord at the harvest because they know it's the Lord that causes all things to grow. And he was the provider for them, right? And out of what God provided, they they were told to leave some at the end for the foreigners and the needy, right? It's a lifestyle. God has provided so much for us, not just monetary, right? But God has provided so much for us spiritually. Each one of us have things to bring. Remember what we talked about last week? Give us this day our daily bread. Yes, it's the revelation of Christ, but what's another form of bread from heaven? Doing the will of the Father. So give us this day our daily bread. Give me the act that I can do to release the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Giving out of what we provided. But that is another deep teaching in itself. But, I, but the, the, the quick sum up, the wave the two loaves before the Lord. The, the priest would wave the two loaves before the Lord. And, and Jesus brought the Jew and the Gentile together. Now let's get into Acts chapter 2, which we know well, 1 to 5. On the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly they heard a sound of a violent blast of wind rushing over the house from the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all that anyone could bear. Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated, them in, it separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. And they were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were being inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak languages they have never heard. And you can read that up there. We'll keep that up there for a second. The pillar of fire. Where have we seen that pillar of fire before? Right? The pillar of fire led them in the wilderness, right? Cloud by day, fire by night. So powerful that even that pillar of fire, which we will obviously know is the Lord. He went before them, right? But when Egypt came up on them on their backside before they could cross Israel, where did the pillar of fire go? Went before them and stood between Israel and the Egyptians along with the angel of the Lord to make sure they didn't come. And so they had that season of, of before the waters were parted, right? That, that nighttime, the pillar of fire went behind them. It was a prophetic picture of the angel of the Lord. And then they see this same pillar of fire that came and separated above their eyes. They see the pillar of fire, and it, it separated into tongues of fire and fell upon each one of their heads. So that's, like I said, that's why I do this for fun on Pentecost, right? Not because I'm trying to relive in sync, but it's just a pillar of fire. But it's, 
And Teresa said to me, she's like, there's no proof that their hair was changed. And I said, but there's no proof that it wasn't. <laughs> right? There's no proof that it wasn't. So until it's proved otherwise, just for fun, pillar of fire. Where am I? Yes, the angel of the Lord crossed before them. And they led Israel in the desert. Right now, we're not being, you know, we're not leaving this world. God sent us here, not, or Jesus said, I don't want to take him out, but I want to leave him in right now. Why? Because we're here to build the kingdom of heaven, to release what God has asked us to release, to fulfill the word of the Lord, the will of the Father for this time. And the Lord said, I'm going to equip you. That's what the Holy Spirit is here for the intimacy with the Lord, to understand the deep things, revelation of God, to be able to have that romance, that love with God, but also the power to release the will of God right now here on the earth. You and I both know that we weren't just a boom, a happening in time. God knew when each one of us were born and each one of us has, according to the book of our life, things the Lord desires for us to get done here in the now. As crazy as it is, I posted a quote from A.W. Tozer, don't worry about how crazy it gets. There's a God in heaven who has not surrendered his authority. Hallelujah. Yeah, whoo, yeah, come on, Tozer, Towser, whatever. I didn't know he was Canadian either until I saw that. I was like, huh, we need, them in, we need him in Canada right now. They're good. So why tongues? This is something, too. Obviously, there's a, I believe tongues, I didn't get to it. There's three parts. I believe tongues is a picture of us speaking the word of God with power and authority. Number one, when tongues fell, it was, yes, they fell tongues, different languages. They had to be fulfilled. The Peter uh, preached, and, and, the, and the disciples were praying in tongues, and people from that said, hey, I heard, I hear my native tongue being spoken. Right, so that's what that tongue was for. But I believe in the same thing. It's out of the word of God, right? Where's the authority? The authority is in the name of Jesus Christ. When the disciples went, when Jesus sent out the 72 and they came back, we're going to talk about that later, they got all excited. It said, even demons obey us when we command them in the authority of your name. So I believe, number one, act tongues of fire came for the word of God to be released in everyone's native language. But I also believe that it's a prophetic picture of us speaking and using tongues as the authority of God. As we speak the word of God from our lips, the authority of God is going to follow. You have to believe that your words are anointed. James says the tongue is the most powerful part of the body, or the smallest part of the body, but has, it does the greatest damage. Right? Tongues of fire falling upon everyone's head to release the word of God with authority. The disciples got a taste of it when they went out, and they came back amazed, saying, even demons obeyed us when we commanded them in your name. In your name, speaking, coming from the authority of God. So, where's the authority? It's in the word of God, which is Christ, right? So then we go to Acts 2.10. It just says, just to fulfill that thing I was talking about, it says, uh, a uh, Jew and Gentile, right? We're, we're there. The, uh, it talks about the Jew and Gentile. The fullness of Israel was going to be Jew and Gentile. They're all there. And I never, other than this, uh, from Bradley, their dad, even think about it. Have you ever wondered how Peter and all them had such an open door going into the nations? I never even thought about it. But who was there on Pentecost? The nations. What happened? People heard the gospel spoken in their native tongue. What happened when the feast was over? They would have gone back into the nations. And so when the disciples went out, thank you for that, Brad. When the disciples went out, they had open doors because there was people that were in those places that had heard the word of God preached in their native tongue. And they went out. Yeah, that was, that was, that was borrowed revelation. But, uh, and then Acts 42, 41, right? It says, those who believed the word that day numbered 3,000. And they were all baptized and added to the church. This is the important part of the harvest. This is the start of the harvest, right? It says, Jesus says, the harvest is, uh, the fields are ripe, right, but the workers are few, right? Pray that the Lord will send the workers into his harvest. It's all about harvest. The harvest was a prophetic picture of souls. And he said, now I'm going to fall upon you in fire, and I'm going to give you authority to go to the nations to speak the word of God, right? As you're speaking the tongue of God, the word of God into the nations and see things happen. And that's why Pentecost is so, so important. There's many times that I've wondered and, I, and I've asked, we had a conversation with the guys this week, and I said, I know that I've received the Holy Spirit. That, that's for sure. But there's times when I've been praying, I said, Lord, have I been baptized in the power of the Spirit? Because you see things, right? We see trickles. We see, we see uh, which we've got to be praying uh, for Papa Barnes, his wife up there, right? Joyce Barnes, because she's been getting some tested. But we literally prayed, right? You see lymphoma fall from faces, and then other times you pray and it doesn't happen. I'm like, Lord, I want that. But then I remembered a time 
when the Holy Spirit falls on you, it's a powerful time. And we got to believe it. We have to expect it. We can't be afraid of the things we can't control because when the Holy Spirit comes, you can't control it. And never would I want to control God. One of the lines in The Chosen, when Nicodemus, this is just hearsay, but I love how it said it brings great concept or perspective. When the Pharisees are getting all upset and this guy Nicodemus is discovering that, hey, maybe this is not what we thought. He said, when the Lord Almighty comes, are you gonna t- it moves differently than you expect. Are you going to be the one to tell him to go back in the box you made for him? Come on, right? No, not me. When the Lord says we're doing something different, I say, okay, let's go. Let's ride. It's a spiritual harvest for souls. And I want to get onto this, right? We're just going to stay in Acts. I don't know how much of this I put up. Acts 1.8. But I promise you this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is before Jesus ascends. And you'll be filled with power. And you'll be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and to the distant provinces, even to the remotest part of the earth. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. I love uh, uh, one of my favorite lines about reading the Bible, right? Revelation can't be taught. It can only be discovered, which is why you can have people sitting in the one room, and if they're truly hungry, they'll leave changed, and someone else will leave out. It was good. If you're not seeking, you won't find. The revelation of God cannot be taught. Any one of us can have revelation here in this room. The Lord can come in a dream, speak words that completely change our life. But if we're not seeking, you can tell it to me, and I'll leave unchanged because I'm not in a mode of trying to discover what the Spirit of God is trying to bring us to. Right? All of us have to have that attitude. I love it. Revelation cannot be taught. It can only be discovered. And that's what the Holy Spirit of God will do when we're reading the word every time. Like I pray, Lord, reveal something new. Reveal another layer of this in my life that's going to change the way I think forever. And you can do it. Don't be like, oh, I know that verse. If you ever get to a place where you feel like you just know that verse, say, Lord, I'm going to park here until you take me to a new level. Because there's always a new level even to the remotest parts of the earth. And this is what the Holy Spirit is here. And that's why, like I said many times, I don't want to sound redundant. I'm not chasing miracle signs and wonders, but I believe the word of God when it says if miracle, miracle signs and wonders accompany those that believe. And so if miracle signs and wonders are not constantly accompanying me, there's something in my belief system that needs to be refreshed from the Lord God. Not that I chase it. I chase God. When I chase God, miracles chase me. We can't, we can't be a church that focuses on miracles as much as we want to see them, because then, you're, then, then, then the order's off. You focus the Lord, and when the Lord is there, right? Only the one, what there's, I'm not even going to try and quote it, but there's this song that Adam sent me the other day, and I've been listening to it, and I was trying to get my slides done, and as soon as I started playing it, I started crying. I was like, oh, no, I shouldn't have listened to it. Right? I said, by my hands, my hands alone can't raise the dead. But at the mention of your name, the dead will raise. So glory to the only one who can. Jesus, it's you. Ooh, we're going to sing that one soon, I'm telling you. Yeah, but just think of that. My hands can't raise the dead. My hands can't take cancer out of your body. (laughs) But at the mention of your name. So let's give glory to the only one who can. Jesus, it's you. So we focus, we chase the only one who can, and as we chase the only one that can, there it is. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. We need to understand the concept of harvesting. When the harvest is done, the end will come. So if the end's not here yet, What does that mean? There's still harvesting that needs to take place. And that's when we say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. My will is to do, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of the Father. So, Lord, what's my food today to eat to help help the harvest keep on going? Right? If you're looking for the feast, the next feast to come is the Feast of Trumpets. When we will join the Lord in the air, that's coming in September. Right, Ken? It's yeah. December. Yeah, Feast of Trumpets. And then, uh, and then we're, like I said, I'm so excited. I, I want to put it in your head. I hope everyone can make it. I really want everyone to make it. In October, we're going to go to Adam's Farm. We're going to have a fire for the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're going to worship the Lord and relive that time when the shepherds were there. Yeah, I know. It's going to be awesome. Right? 
Because John used the words, like I said many times, John just didn't say Jesus came and tabernacled with him because he thought it was a cool word. John knew when he was born. The Lord came and tabernacled with him. And I want to celebrate Jesus when he wants to be celebrated. So I can't wait. It's important to see it. But every single feast, you can see Jesus in it. See the Feast of Pentecost? Can't you see Jesus now when you're reading it? In Exodus? Covenant meal, fire, pillar of fire descended upon the mountain. Jesus had a covenant meal and pillar of fire separating the tongues and fell upon all the believers in the room. Yes. Yes. And we know this, 1 Corinthians 4.20. Did I put that one up there? You try the next one. For the kingdom realm of God comes with power, not simply impressive words. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it, Casey. Uh, or, this is, the, uh, this is why the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit. Not only to preach the word of God in word only, but to preach the word of God in word and in action. Right? Word and in action. That is the complete gospel of the power of God. And I've come to sin. I don't mean this rudely because of myself is there. If all I do is preach the word and not see the power of God come in action, then I am preaching an incomplete gospel. And I say, Lord, please don't let that be. If all... My ministry, it's not my ministry, it's his ministry. I'm just jumping in, right? He called me. If all my time serving Jesus is, is simply preaching the word with not the power of action, then I'm preaching an incomplete gospel. And that's what we need to push in. I don't, I don't care how many prayer room times, how many hours I got to go in the prayer room, how many times people think I'm crazy. It doesn't matter. John the Baptist certainly didn't care eating his honey and locusts. I'd be like, Lord, please, I might even fall into Israel. I'll just take the honey, Lord. Can you provide a little quail, a little ribs? <laughs> Can Brian Arnold's ribs just appear in the desert here and I'll be good? Whew. It's a prophetic picture. Look, this is it. We need, we don't just need, right, there's times of words, and, and I shared this story about a year ago, but I want to share it again. There's a time that we met, Rachel and I met a friend. She was going through a hard time. We didn't know there was a hard time, and I had, we called her. We knew it was going hard, and I had this picture over her, and I said, right, and I said to this, um, this person, I said, I don't know where you sit on this, but I said, I saw a picture of pencils being sharpened and giving them and being given to you, and the Lord said that that's a prophetic sign that he's going to come and break through to you. This person started crying earlier that day. This person, kids were out in the front yard carving pencils out of sticks and gave them to her mother. Right? That's the prophetic power of God. That's, that's also a word. But it's not just, it, preaching is it, yes, because this is the foundation of everything that we stand on. This is the truth. Nothing, nothing, no action is going to oppose this. Right? It has to be grounded in this. Everything's going to come out of that. It's truth that's manifesting itself into the flesh. And that is going to come through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went into the desert full of the Spirit. Luke 4, he came out of the desert in the power of the Spirit. Right? Everything comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the last thing I want to share with two more verses. Luke 10, uh, 2 to 4, and then... So Luke 10, 2 to 4 first. He released them with these instructions. The harvest is huge and ripe but there are not enough harvesters to bring it all in. As you go, plead with the owner, capital O, of the harvest to drive, us, drive out into his harvest fields many more workers. Now off you go. I'm sending you out, even though you feel as vulnerable as lambs going into a pack of wolves. You can hit that next. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. You won't need to take anything with you. Trust God alone, and you won't get distracted from my purpose by anyone you might meet along the way. This is the most important part. If you are learning to step into the power of the Spirit for the very first time, or the very first times, time period, let's just say. Let's not say one time. You are going to feel vulnerable. Why? Because what you're giving, you're not giving out of something that I have. I'm giving to you out of faith that the Holy Spirit of God who supplies every need is going to flow through my obedience and supply the need for the moment. That's where the vulnerable goes. Because you are literally not giving out of what, well, we have the Holy Spirit, so that's, you know what I mean, what I physically have. I'm giving out of something that I have to believe is going to flow. And, it's gonna, and the Holy Spirit flows, he flows out of obedience. Our obedience to the Lord. 
right? And, then the, and if you go, go over to verse 9, so you feel, you feel vulnerable. You've got to get over that. Then it says in verse 9, it says, Heal the sick and tell them that God's kingdom realm has arrived and it's now within your reach. So what was the action there? They preached the word, right? He said, heal the sick. There's the action. Word and power. Heal the sick and then tell them the kingdom of God is now at hand, now within reach. The kingdom of God has come to you. Whatever translation you have, it doesn't matter. The kingdom of God is here. Sum up. Period. Right? So that, and then the last one in 20, sorry I'm jumping around, I just didn't want to read 18 verses in a row. However, this is what Jesus says, when they all come back, they're all excited, woohoo, we saw the authority, the fist pumping, I don't know what they're doing, probably, none of the disciples are probably trying to compare who did the better miracle, right, fighting along the way, right? well, yeah, well, yeah, but, uh, so Jesus sees them rejoicing, and this is the best part. However, your real source of joy isn't merely that these spirits submitted to your authority, but that your names are written in the journals of heaven and that you belong to God's kingdom. This is the true source of your authority. What's the picture of that? They received Jesus. They took the covenant meal. And what fell from heaven? When they said, we, we will obey the covenant. When we say, yes, Jesus, it's you. What came after that? The fire from heaven. The authority from heaven. That's why Jesus is saying, because if your names are written in the journals of heaven, the book, right? Whatever your translation says. That means that you belong to God's kingdom. And what's the Holy Spirit according to Ephesians? The Holy Spirit is like a seal set upon us. So if we have the Holy Spirit, which we all do, those that call upon the name of the Lord, receive Jesus Christ and submit to him, are given the gift of the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a pledge for greater things to come, which is, that blows my mind on its own. Like, how can, it be, how, how can things be greater than having the Holy Spirit of God? I don't know, but we'll see. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. But it says, this is your true source of authority. So the true source of the authority is that you belong to God. And when you belong to God, you speak the words of God and things change. But it all comes out of the power. And the last verse I want to share with you, and then we're done. The other day when we were in intercession, I was praying, and I felt the Lord ask me a question. I've been pondering this for a while, and the first question I felt he asked me was, what do you think I came to build? And what, was my, what do you think my first answer was off the top of my head, those that know me? Kingdom. I came to build kingdom. I didn't hear anything, so I was just standing there. And I heard it again. What do you think I came to build? And I was like, kingdom? And I just started rolling. I, it was probably about, I don't know, five, I don't know how long it was, minutes. And I didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden, I heard one word. A go, well, two words. A garden. A garden. Think about the garden, right? When, Adam, when, when the Lord put Adam and Eve onto the earth, he didn't put them in a fortress. He didn't put them in a kingdom. Where did he put them? In a garden. What's in the garden? Food, water, shade, shelter, everything you need. Walking with God, right? Jesus rolled everything back to Adam, like the River Jordan rolled all the way back to Adam when they crossed into the Promised Land. A town called Adam, it said. Remember? So this is a verse you've heard me preach probably about a year ago, and I want to read it again. And this is what the Lord's calling people to bring. Because once the Lord builds the garden of intimacy within you, the kingdom of God will be released by default. Because if you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, my, if, if I really believe that I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit, then there's going to be life coming out of my temple. And life is going to come out of my temple once I've understood the intimacy of the garden. And that's why there's a prophetic picture in Song of Songs, my favorite one, 416 into 5-1. Then may your awakening breath blow upon my life until I'm fully yours. What's the breath of God? The Holy Spirit of God. Breathe upon me with your spirit wind. Stir up the sweet spice of your life within me. Spare nothing as you make me your fruitful garden. Hold nothing back until I release your fragrance. Come walk with me as you walked with Adam in the paradise of your garden. Come taste the fruits of your life within me. Come taste the fruits of your life within me. And that's where you want the Holy Spirit to blow. When the Holy Spirit blows upon you, what's the fruit of the Spirit? We learn them as kids. We need to learn them as adults. Love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, kindness, self-control, right? We keep on going. And if, and if the Lord is blowing on us, those fruits are going to start, the fragrance of those fruits are going to be released upon our life, off our life, from our life. Because the Lord wants to build in you a garden. And when the garden is built, when the place of intimacy is there, you can step into the will of the Father because you get it every morning. 